morning, everyone, and welcome to another online event brought to you by Parkinson's Community Los Angeles. Today, we're talking about how you can improve your speech and voice with Mary Spermelli, creator of the Voice Aerobics System and a friend of the Parkinson's community for many years. Um, I'm Patrick Lasasso, and I'm president of PCLA. For those of you who don't know us, we are a Los Angeles-based nonprofit serving the Parkinson's community. Today's event is part of our Let's Talk Parkinson's series, which is brought to you by our sponsors, Abbott, Advi, Boston Scientific, Medtronic, Linda and Stuart Resnick, and US World Med. So thank you to all of them for making this uh, possible. So before we dive in, let's quickly review a few rules. And we kind of talked about this earlier, please stay muted. We will have time for questions at the end and you can submit them anytime into the chat function if you'd like to do that. And since typing may be difficult for some, I will ask for spoken questions from the audience at the end. And so when you, you have a question, um, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question and then pop yourself back on the mute. It might get a little clumsy there if people are trying to uh, ask at the same time. So uh, let's try to work together in terms of that. Um, now I'd like to introduce you to our speaker. Mary Spermelli is a speech language pathologist who created Voice Aerobics, a voice strengthening program for people dealing with voice changes due to Parkinson's. She has over 30 years experience in the evaluation and treatment of speech, voice and swallowing problems and holds um, speech language pathology and nursing licenses. Mary is a member of the Medical Advisory Council for the Neural Challenge Foundation, which is based in Sarasota, Florida, and is a member of the Education Committee of the World Parkinson's Program. Her website is voiceaerobicsdvd.com, and we'll make sure you guys get that, voiceaerobicsdvd.com, and has tons of great info, including her blogs and articles on topics related to living well of Parkinson's. We are very lucky and happy to have her joining us today. Thank you, Mary, for speaking with us. Ladies and gentlemen, Mary Spermelli. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, oops. We can't hear Mary. Um, can you give her control there, Judy? Or make her, let's see. Isn't technology fun? <laughs> there uh, we, we go. We have a little technical <laughs> issue. We'll uh, try to sort this out. Oops. Judy, we can't hear you because you're muted. I just made you a host, so Oops. that will help a little bit. Okay. <laughs> Let's see here. All right, so give us a second here. We're still trying to figure out. We got a couple more people still coming in here. Right. Um, see if I can admit them. Oh, I can. Hi, I can't get rid of this as, as on here. Mary is gone. Had me for a minute, Judy. <laughs> yeah, okay. Oh, there you go. You're back. Our, oops, I'm gone. <laughs> okay, I don't know why it's doing this. Usually we don't have that problem. Uh, I show that you're on and you're, you're, we can hear you. Um, yeah, we can hear you, no problem. All right. I'm spotlighted. So you're fine, you should be good. Oops. Do I need to do something maybe on my no, side? No, you're fine unless you have Okay, so I'm gonna just, whoops, should okay. I just go ahead and begin? Yes, you may start right now. Yes. All you. right. Hi, everybody. Uh, so thank you, thank you to Patrick and to the LA organization for the invitation to join you this afternoon. Uh, 
I told Patrick earlier that I always see beautiful California scenery in his video, so I decided you should see a little bit of Southwest Florida scenery in my uh, video today. So um, I have a lot of information that I want to share in a relatively short period of time. So I'm going to start with kind of a formal presentation, a PowerPoint presentation. It'll be about 30 minutes, and I'm going to actually move through that information pretty quickly so that I make sure we leave time at the end for discussion and for questions. Um, so for that reason, I'll ask you to hold any questions that you might have, um, but uh, you can always send them through the chat, as Patrick said. All right, so I am going to bring up my slides. All right, and hopefully everybody can see that. And uh, so what I want you to do today, if you're someone with Parkinson's listening, is to just kind of imagine that you're coming to see me today for an initial evaluation. And um, maybe when I can see you all again, I can get a little show of hands of how many people have actually had speech and or speech voice and or swallowing evaluations associated with your Parkinson's diagnosis. Um, years ago, the LSVT Foundation uh, reported that about 4% only of people with Parkinson's were actually referred to speech and voice treatment. Uh, I certainly hope that in 2020 that that number is greater, but I think that in many instances it's still very poor, that many patients and many physicians still wait until people are symptomatic to refer them. Uh, and of course, that's just going to make whatever you're going to do harder. So today you're going to kind of join me for an evaluation. My evaluations, my initial evaluations are usually about 90 minutes long because I collect a lot of acoustic data. Uh, and we try a lot of things so that before you leave my office, I have a good sense and you have a good sense of whether or not the instrument is working. Uh, and then to offer you some options of what might help you. You've already heard who I am, my background. I just would like to mention one uh, thing and another invitation. Next, a week from Saturday, which I believe is October 24th, I will be conducting an online class for the World Parkinson Program. And that's gonna be an actual speech class, very much like what I do every Thursday with my loud crowd. It will be a little early for you California folks. It's gonna be 10.30 in the morning. But if you wake up early or you're caught somewhere else in the country and would like to join that, you can go to the World Parkinson Program uh, website and register. Or on my website, go to the events page and you can uh, register for that and join us. So when patients come to see me for that first visit, um, probably the most important thing I do is really the interview. In fact, many years ago, probably 20 years or more ago, I had the opportunity to participate in a training program that was a training program on physician-patient communication. And one of the most important tenets of that program was to let physicians, and I'll say all healthcare providers know that the most important diagnostic tool they have is the interview. That first contact with you, when I really want to know about you and whatever symptoms you're having. So I'm going to ask you what bothers you about your speech and swallowing. Uh, I'm going to want to know if you have had prior speech therapy, uh, what you did, if you felt it was beneficial, if you were able to retain those improvements that you made, and if, if so, what were you doing? And if not, why do you think that that was? Uh, I'm going to try to probe and find out about what you are willing and able to do. Go to, uh, so willing to do has to do with motivation, okay. your, your self-efficacy, the belief <laughs> that you can um, actually change the way um, you are speaking. Um, but also it has to do with cognitive function. If you have been diagnosed with mild cognitive problems or an early dementia, that's important for me to know because whatever approach we use, I need to be thinking about how I can 
support what you're going to be doing on your own, either alone or with supervision, so that you're going to be successful. So ahead of every visit or at the time of the initial visit, I'm going to have you complete at least two screening tools. And that's the Voice Handicap Index and the EAT-10, which is a swallowing screening tool. And at the end of today's presentation, Sarah is going to send out uh, this handout to everybody. And if you've never completed it, I would encourage you to do that. And it's something you can discuss with your neurologist or, or your primary care physician. So each screening tool has 10 questions and then uh, the sum or the score of them uh, indicate whether or not you would benefit from further evaluation. But I just want to make a few, one or a few, two comments about the voice handicap index in particular, because it's something I've learned from, I guess, many years now of going over this form with patients. Typically, when I ask a patient to complete this form, uh, if I'm talking to their spouse, I will let the spouse know it's really important. I want the person with PD to complete the form because I really want to know what your own perception of the problem is. Now that might be similar, it might be very different from what your spouse or another family member as an observer might indicate, but your perception is important. Well, one day I had a couple in my office, we've been married about 60 years, and the gentleman who was my patient was completing the screening tool and his wife said, oh, can I complete it? And I said, well, yeah, I don't usually give it to the spouse, but I said, sure, you can. So she completed the um, tool and they scored exactly the same, exactly the same. And you think, well, that might not be too unusual for a couple that was married 60 years. But as we went through the form, here's what I found interesting. So if we look just at number three, and so number three says, people have difficulty understanding me in a noisy room. And they each gave it a fairly high score of three. So indicating that that was a fairly difficult a problem. But from the gentleman's point of view who has PD, he was giving it a high rating because it was based on his perception of effort, the effort it took to generate adequate loudness, to sustain adequate loudness in that environment. His wife, on the other hand, gave it a pretty high rating because it was her perception as a listener, as his primary communication partner, of how difficult it was to communicate with him in that setting. Both perceptions are really important, and both, I believe, need to be addressed. We spend a lot of time delivering therapy and focusing on sort of the problems, the symptoms of the person with Parkinson's, but when it comes to speech and communication, it's really critical that we also focus on the primary communication partner and try to figure out and probe with them what we might, I might be able to do to support them, to support you as a couple or as a family to be able to communicate more effectively. So when you're in my office for the first time and we're, you're engaged in a little bit of uh, information exchange with me, again, I'm trying to probe whether or not you are ready or maybe not ready for therapy. So we could say everyone could benefit from therapy, but is everybody ready for it? So if a patient says to me, my voice is too low, it's too fast, my speech isn't clear, then that says to me that's somebody who's already identifying some symptoms. People are always asking me to repeat. I told my neurologist that my speech is slurred. I cough a lot when I eat or I drink. So again, pretty good awareness, pretty good perception, self-perception of some problems, some symptoms, some changes that have occurred in response to Parkinson's. If in contrast, a patient's wife or husband says, uh, or the patient says, my wife or my husband mumbles, they can't hear says I mumble, but the problem is there is they can't hear. Now, they maybe can't hear very well. And if the partner wears hearing aids but refuses to wear them, they're going to probably get that lecture from me. Um, but more often, what that might represent is, again, a, a sort of an inaccurate perception of someone's own speech, not recognizing that, in fact, it has changed. And remember, Symptoms, as you know, if you're living with PD, with Parkinson's, they're subtle. They're not happening overnight. They're happening over years. You know, because you've heard it from other speakers, I'm sure, that even before you manifest the first motor symptoms, you've had the disease already for six or seven years. 
speech and swallowing changes are actually among the prodromal symptoms, meaning they're occurring even before you're having any symptoms. So even though your speech may be changing, volume may be declining, your rate may be altered, it's happening very gradually. So you're kind of adapting to it and maybe not accurately perceiving your own speech. Uh, oftentimes when I call a new patient, so I work with a local neurologist who refers all of his new patients for an initial evaluation. Oftentimes I met with a comment, well, I don't think I need speech yet, or I'm not sure my speech is that bad yet. And so my response oftentimes is a question, well, I'm curious, how will you know when your speech is bad enough? Tell me what symptoms you'll be looking for or identifying. Because if we wait, you or your physician, for symptoms to manifest, you're already a little bit behind the eight ball. It's going to be harder to do, to undergo any exercise program, any therapy program that's going to be recommended. Uh, and then I might have a patient who reports drooling or I observe drooling, and yet I'll ask them, how's your swallowing? And they'll say, my swallowing's fine. Well, your swallowing's not fine. You are having changes in swallowing, and it's being manifest in your drooling. What are you willing and able to do? So from time to time, I'll have a patient who will say to me, you know what, Mary, you're nice and everything, but I, I hate to exercise. I'm not going to do it. I appreciate their honesty, or a, or a spouse might say uh, he or she hates to exercise. Um, physical therapy speech therapy, and if you've been through it, you know this, is honestly nothing more than exercise. They are exercise protocols, usually intense, so usually involving some home practice, and exercise is exercise. So if somebody tells me right on the front end, I hate to exercise, again, I have to really probe whether or not they're ready for a full protocol of a therapy program. But if in contrast, someone says to me, well, I want to speak clearer. I want people to understand me. I know this person's going to be a great candidate. Not only have they identified some symptoms, they've already told me what they perceive as their problems, but now they're telling me the outcome they want. They're telling me what they hope to achieve from therapy. So from that very first visit with you, I should be thinking, you should be thinking about discharge, meaning what's going to happen after that 30 days of therapy, because 30 days of therapy goes pretty quickly, even when it's intense therapy. What supports do you have at home? Will you need support to be able to continue to do the practice? If you live in an assisted living facility and the only time you communicate with other people is twice a day at a meal and the rest of the time you sit in your apartment and watch a news channel, very likely you are not going to sustain any changes or improvements that you have made in therapy. So we need to think about all of that on the front end. So you've heard me say this already, but I'll say it again. Intensive speech and physical therapy is exercise. And um, Patrick, I'm sure, would second it. Exercise is exercise is exercise. It's true for you. It's true for me. 30 days of intensive therapy. If I worked with a trainer, a coach for 30 days, it's very likely I would have a positive outcome. And if I stop doing that exercise, eventually I will detrain. And really the only difference between you and me is Parkinson's. Because as you know, Parkinson's is a sneaky disease, right? It's an insidious disease. It's in the background. And frankly, doesn't care either whether you exercise or not. It's there making changes. So when we now begin the evaluation, we've finished our interview, the primary purpose of that initial evaluation is for us to see what's possible. I want to see if the instrument is working. So I'm going to collect a lot of acoustic data. Uh, I'm going to collect it under a few different conditions. So we want to know, is the instrument working? Can you generate louder and clearer speech? I'm going to uh, collect some voice measurements, and the first time you, you do them, I'm not going to really give you any cues other than to tell you what the task is, but then you're going to repeat them a second time. And the second time, I'm going to use an external device, something that I actually developed about five years ago called the High Volt. The High Volt is a voice-activated light that's housed within a bracelet. I don't know if you can see it, it's obscured a little bit. 
ah. So it's activated by a voice. And I use it as a simple external cue. So when you complete the voice tests again, and we'll say the first one is to vocalize an ah, I'm going to ask you to vocalize an ah again, but this time I'm going to ask you to be loud enough to activate the light. And that is the only cue I'm going to give you. We know that most people with Parkinson's respond to external cues. Uh, so I want to see and be able to evaluate in a pretty quick and easy way, are you stimulable? Are you stimulable to that simple external cue? And then finally, I'm going to administer all of those voice tasks a third time. And this time, we're going to employ the speech vibe. And in a minute, you're going to see a little video of a patient going through those three scenarios. So the speech vibe is a programmable device. And you will see it in, this, in Leo's ear in just a minute. So it's a programmable device, takes about 10 minutes to program. And it employs auditory masking, a type of auditory masking that in turn elicits a reflex, the Lombard reflex, which causes the user to speak over background noise. This particular device was developed by a speech language pathology researcher, Dr. Jessica Huber at Purdue. And the methodology is actually very old. Auditory masking has been used since the 1930s and it was used it was employed in some devices for people who stutter, but now it's been adapted to be used as, again, a external cue to elicit louder voice without you having to think about anything because it's going to happen reflexively. So under three conditions, I've collected some voice data to see what's possible. So I collect that data using LSVT companion software. That's just a software program. Um, you see displayed the tasks that you're going to do, a loud ah, we do some vocal glides, you read some phrases. Uh, I do I audio record you so that we can, you can listen back and hear before you leave uh, whether your speech and voice was changed by, by generating loudness to activate the light or with the speech vibe. Uh, and so once we look at those numbers on paper and we review the audio or the video, the good news is we often identify that, hey, the instrument's working. So now you just need to train it and get it working up more optimally, working better. You have probably heard from other speakers, maybe other presentations that it is thought that one of the problems that sort of underlies both motor function and speech for people with PD is what we describe as a little bit of a sensory perceptual disconnect. Again, that, that inaccurate perception of how loud or clear one is speaking. And so a goal of, uh, I'll say a secondary goal of therapy over a course of treatment is to recalibrate you to a more normal level of loudness, help you feel what it takes to generate uh, an, uh, an appropriate level of loudness. So what are the available therapy options? We've collected the data, we've reviewed the data, we've reviewed the video, we know that the instrument is working, uh, you're a motivated patient who has expressed interest in improving your speech or voice. Um, so you, at the top here, I, I have a comment and I'll just, make one statement about that. So I say working at the top of one's license means that each of us involved in patient care needs to bring the best of our training and expertise to the clinical process. And here's why I put it here. Therapists, like all of you, are all different. And we all have different life experiences. We have different training backgrounds. And sometimes even therapists become a little overly attached. They become a little too wed to a particular approach. It might be an approach that they've been doing for 10 years. They're very comfortable with it. It's worked with their patients. And even though a new approach may come along, they may be resistant to trying it or to introducing it to their patients. But really, our responsibility is to make available to you all that is available uh, that has been demonstrated to be um, through, through evidence-based research to be of benefit to people with Parkinson's. So here are some options. Of course, you can do nothing. That's Parkinson's favorite, right? Um, but hopefully you're gonna do something. So we have two therapy approaches, exercise programs 
LSVT Loud, which has been around for over 20 years. So many of you, I'm sure, have undergone that approach or maybe are familiar with it. Um, and a second approach, a second protocol is Speak Out. Uh, Speak Out was developed at the Parkinson Voice Project. Again, it's an intensive program with a specific protocol. Um, so both programs, you should be seeing a therapist three to four times a week over a 30-day uh, period. And both programs have after therapy programs to support the gains that you've made in therapy. LSVT Loud has um, uh, loud for Life and Speak Out has the Loud Crowd. And I'll man, talk a little bit about that a little later, which because it's a class that I do. Um, and you can visit their websites, LSVT Global, Parkinson Voice Project, and read lots about their approaches. Um, but in addition to therapy, we now have some speech device interventions. And the real benefit of a device intervention, several I guess, it's instantaneous. So in a way, it's what you hope to gain in 30 days of therapy in one office visit. Um, and it unburdens the user from the cognitive demand, the mental effort of having to focus on some aspect of voice or speech production. We know from the voice literature, even with non Parkinson's voice users, that when we ask someone to focus on some aspect of voice or speech production, how loud, how fast, or how slow you're speaking, it's hard to sustain that, particularly once you're engaged in conversation, because in conversational speech, it's complex. We're listening, we're processing information, we're thinking of our own thoughts. So with a device intervention, it's always going to work. It's always going to trigger the user to be louder. So from that point of view, it really unburdens you from that task, freeing you up to maybe engage in cognitive linguistic activities, focus more on formulating thoughts, word retrieval, if that's an issue for you. So I've mentioned the speech vibe uses auditory masking. Um, the speech vibe is now a reimbursable item through Medicare. Uh, it is also reimbursable through the VA. And again, I would direct you to their website to learn more. They uh, actually have an app that can be downloaded to an iPad if you want a trial of that device to see what it would trigger or elicit for you. Uh, Speech Easy is another programmable device. Speech Easy uses a different type of masking. It uses delayed auditory feedback or frequency altered feedback. It has been on the market for many years. Uh, its original uh, intent was to be a device used by individuals who stutter because delayed auditory feedback uh, has been shown in some instances to help normalize the rate of speech. So for people who have a very fast speaking pattern, what we call festinating speech, people who have the intrusion of stuttering-like disfluencies, which sometimes emerges after deep brain stimulation, they might benefit from a speech easy device, again, that delayed auditory feedback. And then finally, we have personal voice amplifiers. Uh, and they're of benefit, just like they're benefit to any speaker that you might see at a conference or anywhere else, when you just need to project your voice. Um, if your speech is unclear or mumbled or too fast, the amplifier isn't going to change that. It's going to just give you volume. But if your primary problem is volume, you just cannot generate a lot of volume, sometimes an amplifier can be great when you're getting together with your family or your friends. And you just, again, want to be able to be engaged in conversation easily and not be overly focused on focusing on some aspect of speech production. So we're going to look at Leo. You've seen him a few times in the picture. This is a gentleman who came to me for this initial evaluation. And so you're just going to see a little video of him going through these tasks in the way I describe them. All right. And, uh, what bothers you about your speech or your voice? And then at times I can't, no volume. And uh, I guess because of the, the acoustic pneumonia, it's not, uh, my speaking is not clear. It's getting worse. Start. 
When sunlight strikes raindrops in the air, they act like a prism and form a rainbow. The rainbow is a division of white light into many beautiful colors. Take these take the shape of a long round arch with its path high above. Okay. All right, Leo, I am recording you again this time. You are going to read the rainbow passage. You're using the high volt light, and I want you to stay loud enough to activate the light. You can begin. When sunlight strikes raindrops in the air, they act like a prism and form a rainbow. The rainbow is a division of white light into many beautiful colors. Okay, Leo, so I am recording you again, this time uh, with the speech vibe. Can you just turn your head all the way that way for a moment, just so I can capture that in your ear? Yep, okay. And I'm going to have you just read that top paragraph of the Rainbow Passage, and you can begin. When sunlight strikes and raindrops in the air, they act like a prism and form a rainbow. The rainbow is a division of light, white light, into many beautiful colors. These take the shape of a long, round arch with its path high above. So I think that you can hear a perceptual change in loudness under those two cueing conditions. One of the things that I always notice when I'm video recording patients is that that increase in loudness just creates more animation in their face, more movement of the facial muscles. And that's not a big surprise because when you increase that signal, that signal gets increased, gets sent up to all of the uh, muscles. So I'm going to just talk a little bit about some of the programs and products that I developed uh, starting back in 1999 with voice aerobics. So back in 1999, can't believe that was already 21 years ago, uh, I was already working with patients with Parkinson's. I was already uh, offering the LSVT program. Uh, but oftentimes patients would come back to me uh, while they were undergoing treatment, not sure of what they should be doing at home, even though I thought I had given pretty clear instructions. So at that time, I began to create audio recordings on cassettes, and I would give them to patients for them to use at home. And they always reported to me that that was really helpful. And then at that time, because my office was in my outpatient office was housed within a wellness center of a hospital that had an aerobics room. I thought to myself, hmm, I wonder what if I combined the vocal function exercises that at that point I'd been doing for a number of years, coupled it with movement, and if that wouldn't make it easier for some patients, and in a way kill two birds with one stone, right, so that you, you actually are doing both the voice and physical activity at the same time. Uh, so I taught that class for four years uh, while I was working at that hospital, and patients were always asking me for a copy of the exercises, and finally in 2008, I recorded a class on a DVD for distribution, and that's the Voice Aerobics DVD. So back in 2013, I presented a poster, had a poster at the World Parkinson Congress, which was in Montreal that year, and ahead of that Congress, I uh, I administered a survey. Uh, I was teaching the class weekly at a community-based program for individuals with Parkinson's, and I was interested in what the participants' own perception of improvement was. What were they gaining from participating in this class? I mean, I knew what my own observations were, uh, but I wanted to get some sense uh, and kind of begin a pilot study, really, of what benefit there was from the program. And so, Participants had to be enrolled or attending the class for at least a three month period. Uh, some people elected to use the DVD at home on days when they weren't in class. And what, uh, when the uh, data was looked at, what fell out or what got a statistical significance was that people reported a, a perceptual improvement in loudness. Um, so, what I have gathered that from over the years that I have been doing this class, some of the benefits, I think, of this program, when it is used at home on your own or in a community-based uh, setting, it can provide an opportunity for someone like me as a speech pathologist 
to provide education really on an ongoing basis. So maybe those reluctant people, those people who don't think that they have a problem yet, but they're willing to come to a class, now maybe begin to learn about speech and voice and swallowing. Now they begin to tune in a little bit more to what their body is doing. So the focus throughout the 60 minutes is on posture and breathing and voice. So it can be a great tool, I believe, for people who are not ready yet for therapy, but receptive to trying something. So it can be used before, it can be an adjunct during therapy, or it can be used after therapy. It is divided into three sections. Uh, and uh, so even just one section, the first uh, part of it, which is breath work, can be easily used by a, a local support group. You could begin your meeting that way. Um, and uh, so, so that was the original program. Uh, in 2015, I created the High Volt for PDCD. Uh, so that's an audio CD of 27 minutes of guided speech practice. It was designed to be used with the High Volt light. Um, again, because we know that feedback is important. Feedback's important when we're learning a sport, uh, when we're doing exercise. Uh, and the high volt is very simple feedback. It's concurrent feedback. It, you're using it at the same time you're speaking, but it's a very simple cue. Just speak loud enough to activate the light. So I've been collecting data on patients. Now I actually have data on 85 patients uh, that a research colleague will be analyzing for me. But when I had data on 36 patients, uh, it demonstrated that just using the high volt light during the initial evaluation when I was collecting voice data that patients averaged an increase of 7.5 decibels in loudness just on that ah uh, task. So that's a pretty significant increase. Again, demonstrating to you, demonstrating to me what's possible with your voice. So probably one of the most fun and I would say meaningful after therapy programs I'm involved in is the loud crowd. So the loud crowd again is a weekly speech maintenance class. It was modeled after a program that was begun at the Parkinson Voice Project. I began a local group in October of 2016. So this is our fourth year. And some of the people you see on the screen have actually been attending weekly since October of 2016. It's a very committed group. Um, in March, like many of you, our classes went virtual, and uh, now we meet weekly. Um, and I, I can't underestimate uh, what I witness uh, and have witnessed uh, as the benefit of a community-based program. Not only is it an opportunity on a week, weekly basis to review the exercises, to do the vocal function exercises together, um, but it's really an opportunity to get, uh, to get peer support. So it's not just me telling someone to speak louder or speak clearer. Really, somebody else who has Parkinson's, who's kind of fussing with the same thing you are, they're giving you feedback. And the people on the screen here are as diverse as I'm sure the people who are listening to this webinar this afternoon, diverse in terms of the number of years they've had Parkinson's. Some have had PD diagnosis for two years. Some people have had a Parkinson's diagnosis for 27 years. Uh, some people, if you heard them, you would say, wow, your voice is great. Others have changes that either are changes that have occurred from the disease, are changes that are DBS-induced um, changes. But regardless, we're all there with a single goal, and that is to improve the way we communicate. So I think of our weekly group very much like a Toastmasters group. It's a working group. We don't sit around and talk about Parkinson's, uh, but we're there to support one another. And I'm always in awe uh, of the commitment of this great group. Uh, so after therapy programs, in my view, after more than 30 years of being a therapist, that is where the magic happens. Uh, what about singing? People often ask me about singing. Um, and so here's what I'll say very simply. We certainly have some evidence uh, that there 
uh, may be some improvements in intelligibility and certain speech characteristics when singing is used, again, as maybe an adjunct to speech therapy. Um, but it's not a substitute for speech therapy. Uh, when we're singing and the, the music and the melodic line of the music is sort of guiding us and sort of informing us where to take breaths, that's very different than when we're speaking and we're formulating novel thoughts. Uh, so if it has been recommended that you undergo speech therapy, uh, I wouldn't sidestep that. But just as dance supports what you've done in physical therapy, Participating in a choral singing group may be a great way to continue to strengthen and use the respiratory phonatory system. So you're probably sick of me talking at this point. I'm going to pause talking for a moment and keep yourselves muted, but I hope I see some mouths moving and you're going to do a little uh, voice practice. So voice aerobic songbirds is a CD, an audio CD of 22 minutes of speech practice set in music. And we are going to do Diado Tango. Sit up straight, feet flat on the floor. Diado Kinesis is a measurement that speech pathologists use to judge how quickly your lips and tongue can make adjustments for speech sounds. We will say three sounds. Pa, ta, and ta. Then we'll put them together to say pataka all to a Latin rhythm. Join me Ready? in a tango. Great. We're going faster. Michael's Join in me in a bossa nova. Michael Umansky, because I'm watching you. Put them together. Patica, patica, patica. Patica, patica, patica. Patica, patica, patica. Great. We're going really fast. Join me in a samba. Come on, Michael. Put them together. Patika, patika, patika. Patika, patika, patika. Patika, patika, patika. Woo! Are you tired? That one always wakes people up at a conference. Uh, all right, two more slides and then I'm going to be done talking and we'll have some discussion. So I really wanted to focus today just on speech because swallowing deserves its whole separate webinar and maybe you'll invite me back to do that. But here's what I'm just going to say today. Swallowing muscles like speech and voice muscles benefit from exercise. But again, this is not a one size fits all. The exercise that your therapist will recommend should be based on the physiology that they've observed on an instrumental swallowing assessment. And once they have done that, and if they feel that you would benefit from some exercise for strengthening, for improved timing of breathing and swallowing, for improved cough effort, 
these might be some of the things that they will recommend. So respiratory muscle training devices uh, are commonly used. You see the patient at the top right using an expiratory muscle strength trainer, which has been demonstrated to improve cough strength and effort. In some instances, reduce aspiration in patients who are aspirating. At the bottom of the page, you see a patient using an inspiratory, expiratory, respiratory muscle strength trainer. Uh, with a manometer for feedback. So again, may be beneficial for pulmonary hygiene. Someone who is having swallowing problems is having aspiration, keeping things moving around in the lungs so they don't have an opportunity to develop into an aspiration pneumonia, what we call pulmonary hygiene. Improving the use and the strength of the breathing muscles for speech production and improving the use of the breathing muscles and the coordination and the timing of breathing and swallowing. And then there's been a few pilot studies looking at the effect of LSVT voice treatment on swallowing. And not surprisingly, because it's a shared system, speech and respiration and swallowing, uh, that some of that research shows that there may be some transference, there may be some generalization at, of transfer from what you were doing in voice treatment, those high effort voice exercises, to some improvements in swallowing. Again, not necessarily a substitute for swallowing intervention, if that's what you need. Um, but good to know that when you're undertaking that type of voice treatment with high effort voice exercises that you may be getting some benefit in swallowing as well. And then finally, and this is my final uh, slide, because this is a pet peeve of mine. So for years at Parkinson's meetings, at conferences, in my own office, people's alarms go off, it's time for their pills, sometimes a handful of pills, and what do I see them do? Flip their head back and take it with a sip of water. And so for pills to be absorbed, depending on what their coating is, what, the, what their design is, they need to get into your stomach or they need to get into your intestine. And pills that are stuck in your throat are doing neither. And more importantly, as soon as you stop swallowing, whether it's your saliva, whether it's a sip of water or a pill, you're breathing. So when a pill is stuck here at the base of the tongue and the epiglottis and the upper airway and you're breathing, the worst scenario would be that it could fall into the airway and actually block your breathing. But more likely, it's going to sit there. If I were to show you the whole video of this particular patient, what we saw was that each time we gave this person a drink to try to push the pill down, the pill just sort of did somersaults and flipped over and flipped in a different direction until finally it went down. This patient is just a very recent video of a patient of mine. She's had past spinal surgery. She has Parkinson's, but she had neck surgery in the past. So you see some hardware here. She's holding a cup because the pill's already stuck. And now we're again giving her a liquid to see if a liquid wash will eventually flush that pill down. So pills dissolving in your throat are a, are a danger to your airway. They're harmful to the mucosa. Pills that dissolve in your esophagus are very irritating to the mucosa. And more importantly, they're not even getting to where they need to be. So here you are being diligent about taking your pills on time, and they're not even getting to where they need to be. You should be taking your pills with a full glass of water. And again, while there are not uh, generalizations I can make in terms of swallowing exercises, a few general recommendations I would make. You always swallow safer when your head is in a neutral position than when your head is tipped back, because the more you're tipped back, if you're drinking from a bottle or a glass, the more open the airway is, the more vulnerable it is. Uh, taking your pills with a full glass of water will always be of benefit. Uh, so those are my two, com that's my comment on swallowing. Uh, all right, so uh, there's my website. Uh, please vote. We all know how important that is. Uh, and I am going to close out of my slides and rejoin all of you. Wow, uh, can you hear me, Mary? I can. Okay, so everybody can. Thank you so much, Mary. This was awesome. Uh, we have a little bit of time here to take a few questions. Now, as a reminder, please keep yourself on mute. And you can also submit your questions through the chat function, which I'm going to start with those questions. Um, and if typing is too difficult, and we have some more time uh, at the end. Uh, we'll ask for uh, spoken questions. Um, but please wait until I ask for those spoken questions before you take yourself off of mute. Um, so let's just jump right in here. Um, there's a question here from Shireen Inyasi. 
that I think would probably be an easy one to answer pretty quickly. How can one participate in loud crowd? Okay, that is a great question. So again, anyone who has is in the loud crowd has previously participated in speak out speech therapy. So sort of that protocol. And again, those programs were developed at the Parkinson Voice Project. So my suggestion would be visit their website, Parkinson Voice Project. You will see a directory for a, for a therapist in your area who has undergone the training and who provides the therapy and hopefully provides a loud crowd. Um, and if that's not available in your area, they may also be able to put you in touch with someone like me who's doing a virtual loud crowd that, that you, if you have completed the speak out therapy, you can join. Great. Um, how can you get the surveys presented at the start of the lecture? That's from Michael Romansky. Oh, uh, Sarah's going to send those to you. Okay. The, the Sarah, screening tools. Yep. Yep. Great. And um, in the chat function, I see that Sarah just um, put a link to uh, the Parkinson Voice oh, Project.org project. in there. Um, so you can check that out too. So Bob Lavore asks, how do you differentiate Parkinson's related speech changes from GERD, reflux, and predictable aging? Predictable aging. Oh, so great question. Again, how do I answer it quickly? Um, you know, uh, because I'm in Southwest Florida, most of the patients I see are probably 60, 70, or 80. I occasionally get a 50-year-old. So that means I'm either seeing someone in their 60 who had young onset Parkinson's, they've already had it for 25 years, or maybe they're in their early 80s or 70s and they're newly diagnosed with PD. So just by virtue of their age, they probably already have some age effect changes in breathing muscles and laryngeal muscles. Um, and so I just consider that, that that is just something else that we have to consider. What we're going to do about it in terms of strengthening is not really going to be too much different. And I always use Tony Bennett, one of my favorite singers, as an example. At 89, when he was turning 90, someone asked, how much longer are you going to sing? And he said, I plan to sing as long as I can. I practice every day. So an instrument, you know, professional musicians or performers who, who are highly invested in that instrument practice every day. So that is really the key to keeping it healthy. Um, with regards to GER, um, if you are, have a history, a known history of GER uh, and or voice problems um, that have not been responsive to treatments, um, certainly you should undergo an ENT consult where they can do a direct visualization. If somebody's having acid that's getting out of the top of the esophagus, splashing on the larynx, when the ear, nose, and throat doctor looks down at your throat, there's a very characteristic way the larynx will look. It'll look irritated. It'll look a little bit swollen. Uh, so a good ENT evaluation coupled with a good voice evaluation can help tease some of those things out. Uh, and if you do have active reflux, including LPR, which is acid that gets into the throat, that does need to be managed. Somebody Great. asked me, I know ahead of time about drooling, and I don't want to leave today without mentioning that because I'm always asked that. Uh, so again, it could be a whole other webinar, but let me just simply say, um, there, there's not complete consensus on why many individuals with Parkinson's will develop drooling other than it is a non-motor symptom. Um, I think most people agree that it is probably not that you're creating more saliva, but that the clearance mechanism, the swallowing that you were doing all of your life that nobody had to tell you to swallow your saliva is just not working as effectively anymore. Remember, swallowing is a sensory motor system. And even if the muscles are working and if sensation is getting dull, saliva is a weak stimulus for the swallow receptors. And so if the receptors are getting dull, they're not, they're not perceiving the information accurately. If your posture is getting flexed, if your mouth is hanging open, you know, liquids like to go to the path of least resistance. And so drooling is going to be the ultimate result. Um, what are the options? I always encourage patients that I see to consider behavioral 
options, interventions first. And so what's the simplest? Chewing gum. Uh, and your first instinct might be to say, well, that not going to make more saliva. It is going to increase the flow of saliva, but it will also increase the rate of swallowing. And there's actually a tremendous amount of literature from the dental literature and beyond the GI literature about some of the benefits of chewing sugarless gum <clears throat> for dental hygiene and and normalizing the flora. So sugarless gum, if you don't have dentures that didn't get pulled out or partials that move, my favorite is bubble gum because bubble gum has a, has a natural resistance to it. It's meant to be manipulated. Uh, I recommend to people to chew it in about 15 minute increments. And when you have it in your mouth, really move it around. Let it drop between your teeth and your gum. Make your tongue sweep it out. Let it drop over here. Make your tongue sweep it out. Um, a while ago, I bought, because I wanted to try them with a head and neck patient, I had some flavored gums from a company called um, Project 7, and they donate their, their funds to organizations. So I have cotton candy, let's see, I don't know if you can see it, uh, and uh, sparkling mimosa. <laughs> so it's kind of enticing adult flavored uh, gum. But the pieces are pretty small. So I was chewing one right before uh, today's um, uh, webinar and they're pretty small. So I was kind of really having to work to keep it coordinated and get it over and flip it over to the other side. So chewing it for 15 minutes with bubble gum, using it, using it like a little TheraBand for your tongue push your tongue against it, use the resistance of the gum. Yeah. Um, so that's a suggestion. Another suggestion I make is to wear a sports band, a little terry cloth sports band. Because even in my office, when a patient pulls out a hanky or a tissue, wipes their mouth and then lays it on my table, ugh, yuck. I don't particularly like it. And I'm sure when they're at their friend's house, laying it on the coffee table <laughs> isn't real pleasant. If you have a little sports band, and you need to wipe your mouth. It stays on you. Toss it in the laundry when you get home. But what's interesting to me is this. On occasion, I have patients that have drooling that is so severe that it is literally dripping out on their shirt. But very often, patients who report drooling to me are very aware of it. And so they are pulling out their hanky to wipe their mouth. So what I suggest to them is just having the wristband on may serve as a visual cue. So now you're just getting ready to wipe. Why not gather up that saliva, make a tight lip seal, swallow hard, and it's just what it sounds like. Engage those muscles, swallow hard, and swallow that saliva. Keep the mechanism working. And if behavioral interventions fail, then Botox injections uh, can be helpful. They dry up the saliva. Um, but keep in mind, too much saliva or too little saliva, neither is a good situation or comfortable for most people. A dry mouth is not pleasant. A dry mouth increases the opportunity for dental caries. A dry mouth makes it difficult to keep the food bolus cohesive. It tends to particle apart more. It may, may make it harder to transfer the bolus. Uh, so again, work with your speech pathologist um, and ask them for some suggestions of how you can manage that problem. It is a swallowing problem. I guess that's the other thing I would say. If you are drooling and you have not undergone a swallowing assessment, you need to request a swallowing assessment because you have pretty key information there that the, that the sensory mechanism is faltering. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Mary. Um, I never, I probably should have checked with you earlier. Do you have, we never do this, but there are so many questions. You've got everybody so riveted here. Do you have a few minutes to stay a little bit of after? To, okay, course. so here's what, um, I wanna just take care of a little PCLA business and then I'm gonna hand over the moderation to, um, you're gonna be in very good hands, better than mine actually. I will hand it over to our friend Judy Harris. I have to run and, and teach a, a, a Zoom class, but. First of all, it's so great to have you with us today. Thanks, so thank Patrick. you, Mary. Thank you. I know I can just see from the faces that everybody is, is really happy that you were here for us. Thank you. So I want to thank everybody. We're going to continue on here, but I, I need to take care of a little business. But thank you all for joining us at our Let's Talk Parkinson's event. And again, I'd like to thank our sponsors, um, Abbott, AbbVie, Boston Scientific, Medtronic, Linda Stewart Resnick and US uh, World Meds for making today possible. Now, just remember guys, we are a nonprofit. 
Um, so we offer these programs, the Let's Talk Parkinson series is something we developed in March because of the way our world has shifted. So if you are getting a lot of this and you wanna make a donation to pcla.org, that would be awesome to help us continue this work uh, through this time. Um, we'll keep you posted on future events and you can always reach out to us with questions at info at pcla.org or by, by our phone number, which is, I'll just give this once and then Judy can give it again, 310-880-3143. And you'll be reaching our wonderful information and referral person that many of you know, Sarah King. So I personally want to thank all of you for um, coming and your support. And I'm going to hand this over to Judy now, and I'm going to run. And again, Mary, thank you so much. Thank now, you, Patrick. Let's not keep her too long, guys, because we're running over. So try to maybe another five or 10 minutes, and we'll try to get as many questions as we can. Judy, there are some uh, questions in the, the, uh, the text box, and then hopefully we'll have some time uh, afterwards. You guys can unmute yourself and get the questions. So uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mary. And Thanks, Patrick. Judy. Thanks, Patrick. Judy, let me just also say that that if people would like to contact me directly, and again, they're going to get some information from Sarah that will have my web address on it, you can email me. Um, I'm happy to respond to that. Uh, I also just want to mention that anytime somebody purchases an item from me, they are always um, uh, offered a free online coaching session. Uh, so we do a Zoom meeting like this because I want you to be successful in using whatever it is that you have obtained. So again, just to let you know, that's another way to contact me. Great, thank you. You know, one of the questions people asked if um, we'll be sending a link, oh wait, no, that's Sarah. Uh, they asked if this is recorded. Yes, it will go up on our YouTube channel. So you'll be able to find it there and we will have access to all of her slides as well. So you will have that available to you. Um, we do have a question from Jackie Christensen. I have recently been having TMJ issues. So chewing gum is a no-no. What about jaw clenching? Yeah, so you're correct. Chewing gum would be a no-no if you're having TMJ problems. Um, you could try um, sugar-free candy uh, if you're not at any risk of um, choking on that. Uh, again, may, may provide the same stimulus, increased flow of saliva stimulus to increase the rate of swallowing. Um, uh, same, I have some patients that have oral mandibular dystonia, so spasms in their oral muscles or jaw muscles. Again, that would not be a, someone who I would be recommending gum chewing to, which would serve as probably a trigger for more spasm. So thanks for mentioning that. Yes. There, there's also uh, Gail Gately also has asked, what about the breather fit? Is it something worth looking into? How does it work? Yep. So... Um, again, uh, the breather fit is sort of a newer generation of the original breather, uh, a device that I've been using for over 25 years. It's an inspiratory, expiratory, respiratory muscle strength trainer. Uh, breather fit was just designed with a little bit higher resistance. Uh, so it's marketed a little bit more towards athletes and healthy adults. Um, and uh, um, so you know, again, when you asked how do we separate age changes, uh, any or all of us could benefit from respiratory muscle training because as we age, basically from the time we are, we are walking against gravity, our breathing tends to get higher. And then as we're older, often more shallow. We know that there are inspiratory and expiratory muscle changes that are associated with Parkinson's, uh, rib cage stiffness. So using a respiratory muscle strength trainer can provide increased movement, or so in, in a sense, range of motion, um, but also strengthening those muscles literally for access for voice production, for cough, uh, as I mentioned, pulmonary hygiene, keeping things moving around in your lungs. Um, so, um, and you can, um, on my website, I have a, a little video of a patient of mine, uh, using the device. So you can see, kind of see that there. I also have a couple of YouTube videos, um, voice aerobics, YouTube channel, uh, of me demonstrating the breather, uh, and using it. So you can look at that. Great. Thank you. So here's it. We had an offline question. My voice gets weaker, softer as meds wear off. I practice vocal exercises. 
but it is still really hard to speak loudly or for long periods without meds on. Also, cheek gets tingly and cramps, dystonia. Very painful and distracting. Any suggestions should DBS help? So I don't know you, so it's hard to make specific um, suggestions, of course. Uh, I don't want to sound like a Supreme uh, Court candidate in avoiding questions, but, <laughs> um, but um, uh, I would say this, uh, DBS is not typically uh, indicated for dystonia. It's indicated usually for dyskinesias. Uh, and um, uh, and or manage, better management of tremor when drugs aren't aren't being effective. Since you notice it as a wearing off symptom, which is pretty astute on your part, I think it's something that you need to discuss with your physician. You know, it's interesting. Most of the literature suggests that dopamine replacement medications, carbidopa, does not have a real direct effect on speech and swallowing. However, if somebody is having general symptoms, wearing off symptoms, freezing or um, increased tremor, anxiety, any, any symptom really, then speech and swallowing and or breathing may very well be affected during that time. Um, one of the things I always try to emphasize to patients is just mark on a calendar, even over a two week period, you don't have to write a lot of information, but what you are noticing, because when you bring that kind of a simple diary to your physician, particularly if you're there for 15 minutes, it can be some of the most useful information for them to see, can they make an adjustment in your medications that give you a longer duration of on time and less of those uncomfortable sounds like off symptoms. Um, dystonias can be very painful. They can be very intrusive. Same with dyskinesia. You know, I um, sometimes have patients where the dyskinesias are so active, they're so, they become a distraction to communication, but they're intrusive because you're, you have someone who is trying to use the muscles in a relatively normal way with this abnormal movement being imposed on it. So it's really something that you have to keep track of, and if therapists are observing it in, in a session, uh, also contacting your neurologist and discussing it with them. There, there are different versions of carbidopa that have longer on period. Uh, so those are things to talk about with your neurologist. Thank you, Mary. We have one last one, and the question was, and we weren't sure if this one had been done, but how do you differentiate PD-related speech changes from GERD reflex and predictable yeah. age? And, and we kind of talked about, talk about uh, talked about that. Yep. Um, probably a good visual exam by an ENT to rule out uh, certainly any pathology, meaning polyps like Dr. Fauci had, or right. nodules, or GER. Um, so an ENT exam is going to rule that out. Um, and um, and then a, a good ear and and an experienced voice therapist is probably also going to be able to tease out. Uh, some of that and make appropriate recommendations. Well, I want to thank you so much. This was so informative. Thank I, you. We want to get that, the musical video. <laughs> I thought it was wonderful to, to work that. It's fun. And this was so much fun. And I appreciate you spending time with us. Can I, can I just tell you a really quick, funny yeah. story? So I, I became very, very close friends with Kate Kelsall. Some of you might know her name. She has since passed away, but she had Parkinson's and she was a blogger. She was an award-winning blogger. And we became like sisters, really. We just forged a friendship. And when uh, I created the Songbird CD, she was one of the first people I sent it to. And she, uh, and we would talk, email almost every day, or we would talk. And, and about a week after she had it, she emailed me and she said, hey, Mary, I got my first speeding ticket ever. And at, when she got it at the time, she was doing uh, diodo, <laughs> the, the diodo tango. Uh, and I guess that fast pa -pa 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 accelerated her car and she ended up with a speeding ticket. So I, I do give a warning <laughs> while it's fun to use in the car, make sure you're a passenger and not the driver. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Mary. Again, it was wonderful to all of you that joined us today. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us, and we hope that you will stay in touch and come back for more of our Let's Talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you, Mary. Thank you.